Hey guys, Greg Knuckles here with stringtheory.com, and today we're talking about genetics and how much they impact muscle growth, how much they impact hypertrophy. Um, for, for the more astute viewer, before we move on, uh, just know that when I talk about genetics, it's not necessarily the, the more classical definition of genetics, just purely the coding portions of A's, T's, C's, and G's. Uh, I'm using genetics kind of as a shorthand for... Um, the innate factors you're dealing with that influence your results. So those are the genes themselves, uh, but it also includes things like copy number variation, so how many copies of each gene you have, um, gene expression, so epigenetic factors, which is another big umbrella, uh, factors in utero and childhood that impact gene expression, and then also phenotypic factors, um, prior to, you know, actually starting training. So uh, when I talk about genetics, just know that that's kind of a shorthand for uh, all of those innate factors that are, you know, more or less set, but still somewhat plastic uh, when you first pick up a barbell. So uh, with, with that out of the way, uh, there are two studies I want to look at. One is by uh, Bamman and colleagues, and the other is by Davidson. They'll both be linked in the description. Uh, and just know that this is um, just kind of a snippet of a longer article about genetics and uh, just training and performance in general that I'm working on. Um, but yeah, so so the first one by Bannon, what they did is they recruited 66 untrained people, um, put them on a, a pretty solid training program, actually, uh, looking at quad growth. So it was three times a week, squat, leg press, and leg extensions for three sets of eight to 12 every day. So uh, nine sets per workout, 27 sets per week, all sets taken to volitional failure. So, you know, pretty solid training program if you're looking to, uh, looking to see differences in quad growth. Uh, so it was 66 people and then uh, they used a statistical technique called K-means clustering uh, to divide them into three different groups. Um, one group they termed non-responders, um, moderate responders, and extreme responders. Um, so first, first things first. Before we move on, I, I kind of I want to address those terms because they're somewhat misleading. So um, the non-responders group, um, they on average did not uh, their their quads didn't get any bigger over the course of the study. Uh, but to call them non-responders is, is probably not entirely accurate. Uh, all that says is that they didn't respond to the training program that was run in the study. That doesn't that doesn't mean that they that there's no way that their muscles could get bigger. Just that they didn't respond to that particular training program. And then uh, the extreme responders with with that type of wording, people people kind of get the idea that they are just like extreme outliers. But uh, keep in mind, there were 66 people in the study, and uh, the top 17 people were termed extreme responders. So, you know, this isn't one in a million type people. These are, you know, roughly one-sixth of the participants involved. And um, the participants weren't all, say, like, young college-age men, like are in most studies. Uh, it was split evenly between... Uh, 20 to 35 year old men, 20 to 35 year old women, 60 to 75 year old, I believe, men, and 60 to 75 year old women. Um, and it's also worth pointing out that each uh, each age and sex, um, each age and sex cluster was represented in all three responder types. So the uh, the majority of the extreme responders were young men, as you'd expect, but there were also, uh, I think, one or two elderly women in that cluster, uh, and there were also young men in the non-responder cluster. So uh, all, all four age and sex groupings were represented in all three clusters. Anyway, so with that out of the way, uh, the results... Um, were, were pretty eye-popping. So, like I said, about the, the lowest sixth of the responders, on average, did not gain any muscle size whatsoever. Uh, some of them got a tiny little bit bigger. Some of them, actually, their muscles got slightly smaller. So, uh, 16 weeks training hard, 
and your muscles get smaller. So that sucks. Uh, the the uh, moderate responder group, so roughly the middle two thirds of participants, uh, on average, their quads got uh, increased in cross-sectional area by about 28%, if memory serves. And the extreme responders, so again, not one in a million type people, but the top sixth, uh, the top sixth of people in terms of muscle growth, their quads on average got 58% larger, so um, slightly more than twice the growth of the modest responders. Um, and then I'll, I'll flash results up here as well. Uh, there's one guy, or I'm assuming it's a guy, who is almost an outlier among the extreme responders as well. So you'll see most of them kind of cluster towards sort of the modest responders. And then there's one dude who just got even way more jacked than everyone else did. So um, if, if his starting muscle cross-sectional area was anywhere close to the group means, that means his quads had about uh, increased in cross-sectional area by about 70%. So um, huge, huge difference in response right there. Um, and then you see similar things in uh, Davidson's study as well. So um, I don't remember the exact details of that training program, but I, I remember it was also solid. It was a study out of McMaster University, if memory serves, and they know, they know how to run a good training study. Um, yeah, and so it was basically the same thing. It was 12 weeks of training looking at uh, changes in lean body mass. And again, there was a huge difference between um, low responders and high responders. They split them into two groups for analysis, uh, roughly a three to four fold difference. Um, with the top, top people in the high responders group, uh, a couple people gained um, six kilos of lean mass in 12 weeks. And these were untrained people uh, recreationally active, but not lifters. Um, but you know, that's first three months under the bar gaining like 13, 13 and a half pounds of muscle. That's ridiculous. Um, and the group average for the high responders was about four kilos of muscle. So closer to nine pounds of muscle in 12 weeks. So, you know, not too far off of a pound of a pound a week, whereas the low responders, yeah, I should have got the exact number, but it was, it was closer to about a kilo and a half of muscle. So, you know, there's not too much you can do with this information. Uh, it's just something that it's, it's good to be aware of. Uh, and something else to point out about both of these studies is that there weren't any significant differences between uh, high responders and low responders or uh, extreme, moderate, and non-responders at the start of the study. Um, going into it, on average, their muscles were uh, basically the same size. They're like you, you wouldn't be able to tell the high responders from the low responders just by looking at them. Uh, it wasn't until they actually got under the bar that, you know, big differences in hypertrophy actually, you know, manifested themselves. So, um, you know, that's, that's just a good thing to be aware of. Uh, this, this kind of relates to my, to my last video about the law of truly large numbers. By the way, I said I was going to start uploading like three times a week, and I think that video is from July or, or August. So, uh, yeah, really dropped the ball there. But um, gonna going to try to pick it back up. Not making any promises, though. But, uh, but yeah, so um, in both of these studies, you had basically a bell curve in responses, which, which is what you would expect, um, you know, because you're dealing with, you know, biological creatures. We tend to exist on bell curves. And, you know, it's, it's worth pointing out, one of these studies had, I think, 56 people, maybe 54, 56, something like that. And one of them, 66 people. And you still got that big of a range in responses. So, you know, People in both studies lost small amounts of muscle over the course of the study, and people in both studies uh, gained tons of quad thickness, 
you know, 13 pounds of lean body mass over the course of 12 weeks, like huge gains. And so the thing to keep in mind is when you're dealing with bell curves, the, the odds that you're dealing with someone who's truly a freak in sample sizes of 50, 60 people, it's pretty small. So, you know, those, those, uh, when you're, so let's say you're dealing with a sport like powerlifting, bodybuilding, several thousand competitors in both sports, the odds are, are extremely, extremely good that the people who uh, do the best in those two sports are probably uh, substantially more genetically endowed than the top people, even in those studies, who, um, you know, got results in 12, 16 weeks that were truly eye-popping. So, and then also <laughs> some people really do just have a tough run of just have a, a tough run of luck in terms of the hand that they were dealt. So um, you know, just because someone isn't super big, super strong, that doesn't mean that they aren't necessarily putting in the work and you know getting getting everything out of it that they could be. Some people just weren't dealt a great hand. And then on the other hand, you know, some people it just seems like they can look at a weight and get bigger and stronger. Uh, and, and those people are out there and they're not, they're not as, one of the main points I want to make is those people aren't as rare as we like to think. So the people who, who do have, you know, a, a really poor hand they're playing, those were about the six to the people in those two studies. So you may, you may not see those people that often at gyms because, you know, likely if they started training and they don't get any bigger, uh, you know, they don't gain any muscle or very, very little. They probably don't stick with it. But, you know, those people aren't all that uncommon. And the people who get the really, really crazy good results, you know, it's not every person walking down the street, but it's not, it's not nearly as uncommon as, as people think it is. So, um, oh yeah, and then the, the key point I wanted to make here, again, going back to the fact that pre-training, there weren't big differences between high responders and low responders. One of the things I always come back to in a lot of, theoretically, one of these days in a lot of videos, but in a lot of articles, definitely, is you don't know how good of a hand you are dealt until you actually play it. Um, you know, you shouldn't, you shouldn't start with assumptions that limit yourself. You shouldn't start with those self-limiting beliefs. Um, you know, if, if you're not expecting much, then that does give you kind of a security blanket. So then if you don't achieve much, you know, since you were coming into it with low expectations, uh, you don't really beat yourself up about it. But at the same time, having high beliefs, high expectations about yourself, that is probably going to, um, you know, actually impact your results in a positive way, uh, pretty notably. So, um, I, I wrote I wrote an article, a few articles about that, um, looking at some placebo research on steroids that I'll link in the description. Uh, but so it's been like 13 minutes, uh, so that that's enough rambling for now. Um, but again, genetics just uh, there's there's a much bigger spread than than I think most people realize. And main thing I wanted to get across in this video is just how large that spread is and. Uh, how how relatively common the people on either end of that continuum are. And the fact that, you know, you don't know how good or how bad your, gene your genetics are until you actually train hard, put in the work, expect to get results, and then, you know, you may just surprise yourself, you may wind up disappointed, but, you know, you don't know until you try. So that's about it. Uh, thanks for watching, and... Uh, Hopefully it won't be five months until my next upload.